This is Hops and Spirits Bar Conversations. Come for the craft beer, bourbon, whiskey, and great drinks. Stay for the conversations. Here's your host, Jonathan Green. The calendar has officially flipped into March. I can't believe we're two months already into 2022. Uh, what a year so far. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. we got a great episode for you this week. We have Coil Girelli, uh Americana artist, multi-platinum producer, just a, an all-around awesome dude. Uh, Coil's going to be talking about his brand new album, Funland, uh, which just dropped a couple days ago. We also have Kevin Patterson on to talk uh, and tasting notes for barrel-aged beers. And it's not just bourbon barrels, whiskey barrels, all sorts of different barrels that that beer can go in and come out um, tasting really well. But we'll talk a little bit about how all that works together. And like I said, Coil is our conversation this week. It's a fun one. I hope you have fun. I hope you enjoy it. And I hope everyone's staying safe. It's almost time. Where did I where, where did I put those? Here they are. <laughs> it's time for tasting notes. Back again for another tasting notes is Kevin Patterson, a Cicerone and National Beer Drudge. He's also the manager of the Beer Trap Beer Trap Craft Beer Store in Lexington. Kevin, welcome back. Well, thank you, Jonathan. It's good to be back. And and it was good seeing you the other day. I, I was glad I actually got to go out and, and visit you at the Beer Trap. Yeah, I mean, I, I get that completely. I'm, I'm very lucky I have a very social job. If not, then I'd probably be a hermit staying at home, doing a lot more too. It's a, you know, I guess the, there's a pressure to, to be at home and do more at home, even though we, the pandemic seems to be winding down. Um, there's still a lot, of, a lot of needs at home. So having the job I do really gets me out and about. I know midway through the pandemic, probably a year, year and a half ago, this guy says, uh, on a message board somewhere, he says, um, I just miss sitting at a bar and having a beer, just like you did the other night. Um, and he says, I don't care what bar it is. I don't care what beer it is. I don't care who's around me. I just want to sit at a bar, have a beer. So of course, having the job that I do, I chimed in. And I said, well, I'm probably the only guy in America who's been able to sit at the bar every night and have a beer. Now, granted, the beer selection was fantastic. I said, the beers aren't cheap and the service sucks. <laughs> and I have to do it after hours. And so that's whenever you kind of follow in one or two whenever you have time. But I was able to sit at the bar the entire time. So it was good to see you sitting at my bar. So thank you for coming in. Absolutely. And, uh, and because of what you do, you're able to kind of, you know, give us some knowledge on, on some things. And I figured, you know, this time of year, a lot of people are, are still thinking of barrel aged beers. And most times I think people think of uh, bourbon barrels, you know, those have those styles that come in at, you know, 17, you know, 12, 13, 14, even upwards of 17, 18%. But that's not the only thing beer can be put into a barrel of. So what are some um, barrel aged beers that people may not always be familiar with? Yeah, we're kind of inundated in this area with the bourbon stuff. So clearly our mind goes there first. And the bourbon barrels, I think, work great for like imperial stouts or some barley wines, big porters that have those kind of chocolatey notes, caramel notes, uh, roasted flavors, coffee things, chocolate. It, it all goes well with bourbon. However, uh, I've seen some people try to put things like uh, Belgian beers in bourbon barrels, and that just doesn't work particularly well for me. But I've also seen people try to put uh, those kind of big stouts into wine barrels, and that doesn't work for me. <laughs> so what I really like is for Belgian beers, because they have this tendency to be a little bit whiny anyway, go ahead and use those wine barrels, red wine for the dark beer, uh, even the Chardonnay's uh, barrels for the lighter colored Belgian beers. And those seems to work out particularly well, too. One of the little, I won't call it a trend because there's not enough of them to become a trend. One thing I really like is some of these sour ales that I see in tequila barrels. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes sour ales have a tendency to go a little bit margarita for me anyway. So why not use the booziness and the, that woodsy nutty oakiness that you get from those tequila barrels to further inform that flavor of a margarita, just a nudge, nudge further. And, and I was going to say, I mean, you know, obviously barrel aging has been around for a good while. Um, are there styles that obviously play better? You kind of touched on it a little bit. I mean, Sours, though, I mean, they can be tequila, wine to a degree. I mean, I don't think a barrel, a bourbon barrel would be wise, but I mean, you also have a lot of other liquors out there nowadays that can kind of play play off of that. Yeah, we had a quad one time from Mickler uh, that was aged in a Schomburg barrel. I didn't even know Schomburg came in barrels. So I had to do some research on that to kind of find out what's this raspberry liqueur like, you know, and, you know, what was it going to impart? And it turned out it was delicious. 
uh, they did some things, I think, in Grappa barrels uh, a while back as well. You choosing some of those Belgian themes, I think, works works good for those types of barrels. Um, but I do think, you know, you got to consider the type of alcohol that the beer is going to have. Beer, you know, it's made with a lot of different kind of yeast and every yeast is going to give it a different flavor of alcohol. So you got to consider that spice. And what's the spice of the barrel going to do uh, for the beer? Is it going to conflict with the flavors already developed by the brewer? Is it going to complement? Is it going to overpower, overshadow? So you get the types of barrels that matter and the age, how long you're going to leave it in that barrel. Sometimes, you know, aging a beer in a, in a barrel is, you know, it's preferable to have a, a short duration rather than long duration. Will you want to change the beer completely or just want to add nuances? Uh, so I think you got to consider that. One thing I like about those tequila barrels with sours, you know, what's the major crux whenever it comes to most sour ales? They're still going to run you five, six bucks and they're three and a half, four and a half percent alcohol. So if you put in a tequila barrel, what happens to the alcohol? It bumps it up a little bit. So, all right, we got it worthwhile. My ROI is starting to uh, work in my favor a little bit better. So, yeah, let's get that tequila barrel sour. Well, and I also enjoy it, too. The, a lot of breweries that, that have some scale to, to them have barrel programs um, where, where they can kind of do some of these these fun things. Because I've even heard folks say some. So what's your thoughts on this? Because sometimes they just have put a regular beer they already have on tap, put it in a barrel, see what happens. Others develop especially for that. How does that work, uh, kind of those two different approaches? I would think of barrel aging as a little bit like a food and beer pairing where, okay, the beer starts to tell the story, but it might be incomplete. What does the barrel do to complement that story or help tell the rest of it? And I think, I think what you got to do is that the, the beer need more spice. Does it need more dryness? I mean, you do have the tannins that are inside that barrel that's going to dry the beer out a little bit more. The spice is going to have this drying effect on the palate too. Um, so you're not just getting those kind of fruity nuances like from a tequila barrel or the coconut nuances from a bourbon barrel. You do get a lot of different characteristics. So I think you got to look at it in, you know, what intensity, you know, you get the intensity first. You know, how intense do you want this barrel to play out in this beer? Secondary, what do you have that's a complement? What flavor of the barrel complements the flavor in the beer? And then you got to look at balance or contrast. You know, where does the barrel tell the rest of the story that the beer begins? There's a, a lot of different things that go into it and a lot of different flavors that, that can come out of it. I know one of my favorite styles these days is uh, some of those sour aged, uh, you know, barrel aged sours and also enjoy a good uh, kind of just regular ale um, aged in a barrel. And like, like you said, there's uh, a plethora of <laughs> options out there and it's again, all down to taste. Exactly. I know our local brewery, the Alltech guys uh, with Lexington Brewing Company, yeah, they kind of started the barrel aged trend. They did it in their Pale L. And even though that beer's changed a lot, people have a lot of thoughts and feelings about those changes. You know, that's still a formidable beer. I've had probably a dozen other beers that's tried the same thing. The only reason those breweries, for instance, recently had one from New Belgium. Uh, the only reason that they tried that is because something that Alltech already started. So the influence of the bourbon locally, that really matters a lot to us, has become this trend that's really taking off. So um, would the barrel aged trend have started without Alltech? You know, being one of the forerunners, I think Goose Island was number one, but Alltech was number two. And uh, I, you know, maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't, but I, I still give Kentucky a lot of credit, you know, and, and also, you know, give bourbon industries a pat on the back. They couldn't, we could have done this if those bourbon barrels weren't here, if they weren't fresh, and if they weren't plentiful. So without that start, who knows where that thing would have been. Very true. And you just never, never know where, where things will go. And I'm always intrigued to see what's next and always appreciate a little bit of knowledge from you too, Kevin. Happy to apply. Remember to check out Hops and Spirits on social media at Hop Spirits, all one word, on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Twitter. You can also find Hops and Spirits on YouTube and at hopspirits.com. Joining us here on the Bar Conversations is multi-platinum musician, songwriter, and composer Coyle Girelli. Did I say that right? Girelli? Perfect. Girelli. Uh, yeah. <laughs> see, I, I was nervous. I was like, man, I think I screwed that up as soon as I said it after <laughs> practicing it all the time before the record button. And and, and Coyle is here. He's also got a new album out um, coming out here. Or is it is it already out? It will be out, yeah, February 25th, yeah. 
Yeah, Funland. February 25th, Funland. It's, a few songs are already available uh, out as well. But, you know, I always like to have a little fun on this show, and it is called Bar Conversations. And tonight I've got a little uh, barrel dovetail. It's a blended whiskey finished in some funky things. And uh, what, you got anything good over there? I have a mug, yeah. I have myself a skinny margarita, which is just lime juice and tequila. So hey. Casamigos and lime juice. No headache, you know, it's basically a fruit juice, that's what I always say. It's like full of vitamin C, it's a fruit juice, I'll say that. Uh, I was going to say, do, do you do you enjoy any other uh, other beverages when you're you're out having a little bit of fun on the town? I, I, love a, I love a margarita, I love a skinny margarita, a spicy skinny margarita. Um, other than that, it's like uh, vodka soda, I'm a vodka soda guy. I mean, nowadays it's like the low cal stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like, you're behaving yourself these I'm days. I'm trying to yeah. behave. Yeah. So vodka <laughs> soda and the uh, skinny mug, and I love a nice glass of red wine. But um, I, I like be, it. Behave with that one because I can go through a bottle without realizing. <laughs> I used and to say he... that each song because I used to in my earlier days I was convinced I could only write a song after at least a bottle of wine. So I would, I would, basically, I would say, well, this album took sixty-five bottles of wine, <laughs> or whatever, two hundred and fifty bottles of wine. So, so you, you were having a good time. You were having a good yeah. time. Now, 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 you're wiser, mature, good, and, and and sticking with some. <laughs> now, now, do you do you ever go for like the canned vodka soda, or are you like gonna make your actually mix a vodka and soda? Yeah, I have to make it. I have to. It has to be a nice vodka in it. Yeah, huh. I, like, I, like I don't that. know anything in a can. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's probably a wise move. That's probably a wise move. And 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 see, it's fun too because I see you're laughing. And, and I, I was looking through your social media account the other day, and I'm like, I feel like your photographer on all your promo shots just says serious face every time you know shoot him oh, almost the blue the, was it blue steel <laughs> it's me it's not the photographer it's me for whatever reason yeah i'm you know i i uh yeah i'm definitely not serious i mean no i am um, no i'm not that serious as a, <laughs> as a human and um definitely enjoy having fun and don't take anything particularly too seriously um but yeah but yeah, my kind of music is has always been from a certain place that I need to kind of feel in order for it to feel authentic. And it, for me, for whatever reason, it tends to be from that little area in the middle of the chest. Um, that is a little serious. <laughs> I don't know what else I was to put it. And, you know, so my music has always been a little bit like that. And then I think stood posing in front of a camera I've always had a more serious and jolly approach but you know yeah I'm not a particularly serious human <laughs> I don't think but I know, I know your music. You know your, your music is uh, some. I know this new album. We'll talk about it in a little bit, a little tongue in cheek, but but some serious kind of lyrics and so forth and, and themes. Now I, I'm curious if you weren't doing this um, music and so forth, what or at least being an artist and and in the industry, what would you be doing if you weren't 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 uh, where you are now? Um, I don't know that's so hard because I kind of feel like I've yeah you know, I was writing stories when I was three or four, and I, as soon as I learned about music, I was obsessed with it, um, and was just kind of prolifically writing music. I've been singing music to everything I did. I must have been so annoying to hang around with as a small <laughs> child because everything was, everything of the song had a theme tune. I was constantly humming, and I didn't realize that that was songwriting, but I was just naturally doing it, for like you know, from the minute I could kind of think. So um, it's really hard for me to imagine doing anything other than this, but um, I don't know. It would have to be something where I was allowed to be a diva from time to time, <laughs> and and um, that I yeah I don't know that I can kind of I haven't found anything that I enjoy as much in and that I can express myself 
So I honestly have absolutely no idea. I really, I, mean, I really have no idea. Some things I mean, are just meant to be. I trained as a lawyer, so my degree was was law, but I never, um, you know, it, it's different in England. It doesn't cost very much money to go to university, so it was just kind of a dos. It was way I was wasting time because we were in a band and we were so it needed a few more years to sort of get back. <laughs> And um, so that was kind of what it was. So I did I did a law degree, <clears throat> criminal law, but um, never really. I was never. That, that was never, that was never be the, the path. path. That... <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Now, now we we were talking a little bit beforehand too. Uh, you you have your own label agency, uh, Honey Lemon Records. What? Why why did you launch that? Was it just so you could have have some fun and release music with folks you like? Yeah, basically. I mean, I had, you know, basically been on, essentially been on, in record deals um, since like 19, you know, uh, from sort of Sony into Universal into a couple of independent deals um, and, yeah, through Sony again. And so, you know, I, I had been through the whole thing and when it came to doing the solo record, I just wanted the freedom, I think, more than anything else. I just wanted to kind of be on my own timeline and, you know, not really have to worry about pleasing an A&R guy, you know, or anything. I just wanted to, especially with Love Kill, because it was such an album I wanted to make. It was, you know, it's not really a radio song on it. It sounds very much of an era. It, it is not the cheeriest record in the world. It was just very much you know, a record and a piece of work that I wanted to make. And um, I think it just made everything easier if it was just, you know, through my own label. And then, you know, since then I've released some other stuff through it, like friends, music and stuff. And yeah, it's been good. It's nice to have, you know, to have the control. Well, and then, you know, obviously you you talk about that solo career uh, or you're at least doing some solo music. How would you describe uh, your your sound as a, as a solo artist, especially compared to to your other bands? Um, I mean, Love Kills is very different. Love Kills is like the album that I always wanted to make. You know, I'm a big fan. Always since I was very young, I've been a big fan of the sort of sixties, big sort of sixties pop ballads. You know, Elvis and Roy Orbison and so much of that stuff. Those huge voices and big big melodies and um, I just wanted to make a record like that you know I wanted to sort of throw my spin on on those types of songs modernize it obviously a little bit but sort of really dive into that world um, so <clears throat> that's obviously very different from the Shevin and um, and your Vegas which is much more kind of new wave or alternative sound um, and then with Funland you know I think I've modernized the sound a little bit. I think that the, um, you know, the, the themes are a little less depressing <laughs> than Love Kills. Um, but I, I, I feel like Funland sits somewhere in the middle of Love Kills and, and the, and the show. Um, yeah. Cause I mean, when, when you were in those bands, you were with, with friends on, on both of them. How, how was that those experiences compared to being 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 solo and, and working out on an album um i mean you know the the, the guys in your vegas and the chevin are my friends from school like my, my best friends from growing up so um you know that's kind of so unique and invaluable to like be able to make music with your friends and you know whether it was in new jersey with or in the desert of texas or you know Wherever we went to make a record, it was just, it was hard work and intense, but you were with your friends as well, so it was kind of fun and ridiculous at the same time. Um, and yeah, in solo, it's, it is different. It's like, um, in some ways, in some ways, you know, there's some similarities because I was, you know, the, the main sort of songwriter and, and creator in, in the band as well, but um, you don't really have opinions to lean on so you kind of have to make a decision or procrastinate and i thankfully have got 
<laughs> out of that habit. And now I just kind of be like, all right, it's this or it's this. And we move on. And, you know, otherwise it takes too long. <laughs> otherwise. So, um, you know, it's different. But I think some of that's just come with experience and, you know, making music. Some of it just come with circumstance. Like you can't just sit there a second guessing all day. You just have to kind of go with something. So, um, so yeah, I think it's streamlined. I guess streamlined is maybe the one word to sum up the difference. Well, and that, and now you're you're based in New York City, correct? Am I right on that? Based mm -hmm. in New York. Yeah. So, but you but you grew up, as you said, you know, in in England and, and so forth. How how did that impact your music or influence you at all, or or, or did it have have a much of an impact? Um. Yeah, I mean, it totally did. You know, England. It's in the blood, it's in the water. Um, we just love music over there, especially rock music. I mean, still, you know, being in a band and going and watch bands is, is just part of the the culture. Um, Brits just love it. Getting drunk as well. And <laughs> at a gig. Um, so, you know, so, we, yeah. I mean, you don't realize it growing up, though. You just think that's the way it is. But when you go to other places, you, you know, you realize the way it is everywhere and England is kind of a little unique with how obsessed with especially bands you know the English are and um and also growing up in Leeds which was not that I grew up in the city but Leeds was the nearest city to the town I grew up in and um and it is uh yeah it has and still has um a great music scene like a bunch of bands and artists especially when we were coming through who were all kind of doing well and um you know there was a band called the kaiser chiefs and corinne bailey ray and a whole load of sort of indie bands and everybody was kind of getting signed and it was all very exciting and um yeah and so it was a good place to learn to be a band there's a bunch of venues that you could play in um there was touring bands who would come through that you could kind of hop in and support here and there and yeah it's it, it, you know, the sort of the culture of the country and the city allows a band enough time to become a band. I hope it still does. It certainly did when we were growing up. Um, and then, you know, the Beatles is in the blood as well. And I think if you start with the Beatles, you can't go too far wrong, you know. So. <laughs> that's a that's a great starting point. And, I mean, yeah. you mentioned them. Uh, you also mentioned, you know, like Elvis, Roy Orbstein, and, and, and others. Are those some of your influences growing up and, and maybe kind of um, even to, to this day when you're, you're making music or, or is it just kind of a, or as I told someone else, I dated myself a little bit. I said, or is your iPod or, or whatever back in the day on <laughs> shuffle and you just never know what's going to come through. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's like, um, it's a bit of both. Like I have like the sort of constant that I always just adore and go back to. Um, the Beatles, Kate Bush, David Bowie, um, Roy Orbison are four for certain for me that I you know listen to a lot, especially when I'm making music. Um, but I mean, I love you know I'll, I'll throw on a playlist and and try and you know find a, a bunch of stuff that that I can relate to and enjoy as well. I was I often do that when running. It's like my Discovery time is like an hour, an hour in the park where I'll just put a, a playlist on of stuff I don't know, and then you know, um, it's kind of a mix. Then I guess you know I try. There's there's so much good new music out there. It's it's hard to um, it's hard to find it all. So it's it's uh, it's a struggle. But there is there's lots of great new bands. Um, so yeah, a mixture, and it depends what mood I'm in as well. Sometimes. I want to listen to something heavier and sometimes I'm putting an opera on and some, you know, it depends. Now, now are you listening to opera when, while you're running? No, I've never tried that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I feel like that'd be a little interesting. A 15 minute mile. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, you talked about kind of, this is something, music is something that probably was always going to be your career i mean when did you know that that's something you wanted to really pursue and make a career i mean obviously it's one thing to just love it it's another thing to to kind of take that stab and and you know make that your your 
almost day job. Yeah, I don't know. It's weird. I was thinking about it earlier, and um, <clears throat> I don't know whether the. I think a lot of it is just. Like you have to have self belief, right? I mean, I'm from a small town where, you know, it's not really that much going on. There's not even a place to play, I don't think, other than the school. Um, but I know there's just something. I think when I when <clears throat> when I kind of discovered bands like Nirvana and even though Kirk Cobain was dead by the time I you know, discovered him and um, you know Oasis and all the Brit pop bands in the in the nineties, you know all that stuff. I, I was just um, I just thought, yeah, I can do that. I want to do that. Um, but the from the moment of I want to do that to actually doing it is. I don't know, dedication, discipline, and a shit ton of work, I think, is what it is. A little bit of wine, too, right? <laughs> a little bit of wine, and a little bit of luck, and all <laughs> sort of mixed up together. Um, because, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a long slog for most people who do it. Yeah, Very few people are successful at, like, 19, 20, you know, it's like a, it's, a, it's yeah, it's work and dedication and discipline. So I would have thought most most people will want to be in a band when you ask them at <laughs> twelve or thirteen or fourteen. Yeah, I, I was gonna say you you can play in the, in the garage or you know your friend's backyard or, or whatever. It's a little different when yeah. you're 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 touring touring uh, you know cities in in your your home country and then going overseas. I mean, what is that kind of when things really were crazy for you you all when you 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 know made the the jump over overseas and we're, we're playing in different countries and different, you know, just a, a whole new world almost. Yeah. Yeah. It's just kind of that thing where you, um, yeah, you're always kind of in it. So you, you have to sort of take time to appreciate it, you know, in the middle of it. Cause you're, there's always some nonsense going on that you're dealing with. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think once we started touring, um, like really touring, I mean, we, we toured a bunch in England um, and it, you know, before the States, but I think once we started touring in America, I think um, it felt like, oh, we're actually professionals now. <laughs> this is like a real thing. <laughs> and, um, and and America is such a beautiful country and, and massive. And so to get to tour it and see it was just a treat as well. You know, keep driving around America and going through all these great cities and um, through, you know, forests and mountains and deserts and, you know, all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think once, once we kind of properly toured in America, it felt real. I still don't think it felt real. <laughs> still pinching yourself at that yeah. point. <laughs> yeah. Surely someone's going to be like, okay, go, go get a job now. Like, yeah. yeah go use that law degree and, and let's see yeah. what, what, what happens. <laughs> yeah. Now, now you're also, you know, you're a writer, producer, composer. What's it like, kind of working on that side of, of things for for other artists? Um, good. I mean, it's kind of what I did. Um, you know, sort of breaking life into chapters a little bit. It's kind of what I did in the in between bit um, of the Shevin and releasing solo music. I kind of really sort of did that kind of full time. Um, and uh, it's good, very different. I learned a lot. I wrote with some amazing people. I think, um, you know, it's a great artist. Um, yeah, I think the best part of it is just learning from other people. Um, either it's like, you know, I think the, the thing that I learned the most from that period was um, just instinct. Trust your instinct. Trust the first idea. Don't overthink. Um, and that came from... The the better the better and the more successful the songwriter, the the more they just go with the first idea and pure instinct. And I think that um, that's like there's a life lesson in that. I think humans overthink all the time, and and um, our instincts are so often right about things. So um, so yeah, it was it was great to kind of learn um, and. 
and I just love working with other people and sort of writing a song from someone else's perspective and trying to trying to see if I can understand the world of a 22 year old girl <laughs> or boy um, but uh, yeah but yeah I love it you know I, I, I really do enjoy um, songwriting and for me for a lot of the time it was so far out of my genre as well I'd be kind of working with hip hop artists or um, dance music or you know really pop stuff that is not necessarily stuff I listen to or enjoy personally but you know, you know collaboration you never know what's going to come out of something and you know you throw all the influences into a pot and stir it up and let's see what happens and that's, that's cool yeah I, I, I was going to ask I mean you know you, you've worked with folks from all different genres I mean is it difficult to go from you know coil you know music and kind of those love kills songs to you know music for you know a Macklemore or BTS I mean that the, I feel like those are a little different on the spectrum there <laughs> yeah kind of... I mean kind of yeah but they all need like a melody and they all need a song somewhere in there you know um, and uh, that and that was my job There's, you'd never want to hear me rap that is <laughs> way out of my wheelhouse <laughs> but um, so those demos and I, and are I don't, never seeing the day <laughs> yeah and i don't speak korean so i didn't write those parts of the bts song um but um yeah i think uh yeah but the sort of whatever needs a melody and a and a hook um i I'm, in, I'm, there, I'm, there, I'm there for now, are are you pulling from like say personal experience, past experiences, or is it just kind of an idea that may be somewhat rooted in in an experience, but it may not be yours or anyone you know, just kind of a something that you can you know, build off of? How how does that go for you? Um. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's like it really it really depends. I think um, you know, there's a certain there's a certain magic to it. I think. There really is a certain magic to it. I think there's formula to it if you want it to have formula, and those songs sound formulaic and they sound like they're off a production line. Um, and then there's, there's stuff that's got, like got magic, and I think that comes from. <clears throat> I don't. I mean, it just comes from a place where you don't really know where it comes from, and sometimes it ends up autobiographical. You know, sometimes. I don't know, it just comes, especially the really good stuff. It always comes from, I always just say it's like this, from this center of the chest. That's where I always feel it pulls from, because that's the place that kind of relaxes once it's written. So it's like, you sit down to write and it's like, a, it's tense and then you write and then it's gone. So it always feels like it comes from the, like the center of the chest. But, um, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, not so much anymore. I think I did when I was younger. Um, now I just, like I say, try to write so instinctively. I don't really think, and that seems to be better now. Um, I write quicker, um, but I just, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It just comes out, and you're like, oh, sometimes it's like there's a song. Shit, we only <laughs> sat down half an hour ago, and there's a song, and um, who knows? It's magic a bit magic I, I was gonna say well i mean and that's that's what that's why you're doing what you're doing and, and making some amazing music and obviously and and when this is is airing um you know you'll have just released the second solo album Funland. what yeah. what can folks expect on, on that because you know I, i've gotten to listen to it and I, i've enjoyed it and i, I feel like there's a little tongue-in-cheek on there and and it's definitely different than yeah. Love kills <laughs> yeah i think well i mean first of all you know I was in a very different place, literally, um, from Love Kills, because it was the beginning of the pandemic when I wrote Funland, and so I um, decamped to the woods of um, Vermont and <clears throat> sort of holed up in a place where um, I just set up a very crude recording setup, um, had guitars and microphone and the laptop, and that was kind of it, and I just sat around writing because instinctively I didn't know what else to do. You know, that was like the beginning of the of the pandemic 
and um, you know, everyone re reacted in different ways. I know a lot of friends who just couldn't write anything for a year. Um, but for me, it was kind of thankfully the opposite. Like I didn't know what to do other than write, so I kind of threw myself into it. And so <clears throat> the idea of being too serious in that moment, I think, was um, I, I just I couldn't be too serious. You know, I couldn't like pile on. You know, there's, yeah, this, yeah. This, 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 this therapy to music for me, you know, it's like it's definitely therapeutic. So, um, so writing about fun and do you want to dance and, and, and fun lands and all this stuff, it was, it was pure escape, escapism. And I was also missing New York. Um, and, uh, and so, so within all that, you know, the album got created and, and I think, yeah, because of that, it does kind of take a ride. It has its moments where, you know, it thinks and it stops and it pauses. Um, and for for the most part, it's just kind of, yeah, celebrating a place or a night that you want to be on or are remembering, I guess, a little bit. Because I was just, you know, it's a strange, strange, lonely time, the, the pandemic. Yeah, so. ab absolutely and and then you know you, you touched on it love kills was kind of a different album so i mean you, obviously you, you kind of said love kills is on one end and your bands are on the other and, and funland's in the middle so is that kind of the best way to describe the the two albums for you that you, you've been able to put out solo i think so yeah i think so um like i said love kills is such like a sort of a singular thought and i was like yeah an album i always wanted to make um and uh but yeah I, i've always loved to write the kind of something that at least have you tapping your feet and there's not much you can tap your feet to on <laughs> so um yeah so yeah i think somewhere in the middle for sure um what comes next in terms of sound you know i've been playing with because I, I wrote a lot during the lockdown and um so there is a, other probably at least another album's worth of similar stuff to Funland, but now obviously time has passed on. Now I, now my head is on to something else. And so figuring out exactly the sound that comes next, I'm still to, still to land on it, but it'll probably be more of a continuation of something similar to Funland and going back to Love Kills, I think. Well, and then, you know, you, you got the new album out and, uh, what what else can folks expect from you this year? I mean, obviously things are hopefully getting more normal-ish, and you get to do some things. I mean, uh, what 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 are you hoping to to do, and and people can see? I mean, play for sure. Um, you know, I'm going down to South by Southwest in a couple of weeks, so that'll be good to to return to that madness and play some shows. Um, I'm playing in the city in New York um, in early March. Um, so yeah, more shows, I think it will be good, um, this year. Um, I've also been, I also worked on a lot of musicals over the last couple of years that are in workshop at the moment. So, um, I hope to have at least one of them on a stage before the end of the year as well. Um, and, and a bunch more songs. I don't know whether I'll release another album this year but i'll definitely be releasing more material um so probably singles or an ep or a couple of eps for the rest of the year um but yeah i'm feeling feeling in a groove now so um definitely more music that, 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 that is awesome and if you want to find out more about coil coil dash com. he's also on all the social media as well and and Coyle, it sounds like, uh, like I said, Funland is out now, and it's it's an amazing record. I really enjoyed it. It's got uh, makes you think a little bit, and it, it but it also is a fun journey. And I, I appreciate you sharing that your journey with me and, and having a little fun and a drink. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me.